Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Anita Sengupta. I am an engineer and a project manager at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is um, the primary NASA center for robotic exploration of our solar system, actually. And it's located in Pasadena, California, not too far from here. So I'm going to be talking to you tonight specifically about Mars exploration and the Curiosity mission, uh, Mars Science Laboratory mission, which landed with Curiosity rover. And my role in the mission was actually working on developing the entry, descent, and landing system Primarily the parachute system and then a portion of the sky system. But I'll give you an overview of the entry descent landing system, how that entry descent landing system performed, and some of the science results that we've collected from the rover to date. But first I want to start with a really cool movie that we made um, in support of the landing, which was on August 5th of this past year. It's called Seven Minutes of Terror, because it takes around seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface of the planet. That video actually went viral. Some of you might have seen it, but some of you have not seen it. Um, but you can download it on YouTube if you're interested, but I'm going to play it. It's a lot of fun. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere. The vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun, 1,600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it'll only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just going to smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. 
we can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane maneuver. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. to form life. And so we've made several discoveries over the past 20 years or so 
about water on Mars. And there is indeed water on the surface of the planet Mars. This picture here on the lower right is a picture which was taken by our Phoenix lander, which I think was 2005 time frame, during the landing event as the engines were basically firing into the ground, taking up all of the sand and dust, it actually exposed salt water ice just beneath the surface, which means that there's tons of water which is frozen in a salt water state closer to the polar regions of Mars. More recent finding was made by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbit, which is a spacecraft which is constantly in orbit around Mars, takes wonderful, beautiful, high resolution images of the surface. We've actually identified what we believe to be active water flows on the surface of Mars. This is the side of cliff face on Mars, these little black streaks that you see. We believe this water flowing down the sides of cliff faces, which means that there are subsurface aquifers on the planet. And as the planet heats up, because it's tilted on its axis during the course of its transit around the sun, that water melts and actually comes at the sides of these cliff faces. Another feature is up here, which is similar, another cliff face. And we actually observed this seasonally with a high rise instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which we believe to be water flows on the surface of the planet. So this is a really interesting recent finding, and the implications are, wow, there's water there. Could there be some kind of organic material in that water? We'd like to go there. And then if we were to send people to the planet, could they actually make use of that water to live and to survive, to, to drink and to grow plants and things like that, obviously in a pressurized environment? But the difficulty of going to Mars is in part to get there. It's quite far away. It takes anywhere from seven to nine months to actually get there. But the real challenge of Mars is landing on the surface of the planet because you have this large gravitational well, because the planet is relatively big, but you also have an atmosphere, which you can use to help slow you down, but can also burn you up and fry you to a crisp, like you saw in the Seven Minutes of Terror movie. And at this particular point in time, only the United States has actually successfully landed on the surface of Mars. The Russians tried and failed, the Europeans tried and failed. So only the United States has been successful um, seven out of the eight times it attempted. The first was in the late 1970s with the Viking, land, Viking landers one and two, which is the image you see over there. We then, about 20 years later, picked it up again and developed the Mars Sojourner rover, which was a tiny little rover, which we landed in the mid-1990s. And then the upper right is a picture of the Mars Exploration Rovers, which we landed on the surface Mars in the early 2000s. And so we developed these technologies over the years at NASA, basically leveraging from each mission to improve our capabilities, to improve the amount of mass that we can land on the surface, thereby improving the amount of science that we can return um, for NASA and for humanity. And so this is a nice picture which shows you the evolution of rover technology over the past um, 20 years or so that we've been developing at NASA with the tiny little Sojourner rover, which was in the mid-1990s, to spur an opportunity to now the Curiosity rover. And Curiosity is a very large rover, about the size and the weight of a compact car. We always like to say Mini Cooper, that's a good reference for everybody. But it's a massive, um, sophisticated robotic geologist, which allows us to make very unique measurements on the surface of Mars, which I'll be talking about a bit later. But the challenge, of course, with sending something this big to Mars is landing it on Mars. And so that was the job of our entry descent and landing team um, at JPL and a variety of other NASA centers that we worked with over the course of around a seven to nine year period. That's how long I worked on it, about seven years. And so the goal of the Mars Science Laboratory mission is actually to determine whether or not Mars could have been a habitat for life. Specifically, to determine if conditions existed in the past which could have supported habitability, which could have supported microbial life forms on the surface. And we do that with this very sophisticated scientific payload, which I'll talk about in a little while. But first, to the landing, that's what I work on, I'm an engineer, not a scientist. And so we have to have this big hunk of metal land safely on the surface of the planet, but also land it in a precise location so that we can get the scientists to where they wanted to go. And so the way we do that is we take the rover and we put it inside a drag producing body, something called an entry vehicle. This body is designed to create aerodynamic drag because you want to slow down as you hit the atmosphere. And in order to slow down something that big, you have to have a really big blunt body. And this particular vehicle was four and a half meters in diameter, so that's roughly 15 feet in diameter, so very large to fit that size rover. We also have a requirement to land the rover in an area which might sound big to you, the size of the Los Angeles basin, around 20 kilometers, but that was an order of magnitude landing precision than any other landing system we had developed before. What that means is that this thing had to be actively guided as it approached the surface, not by us, it did it autonomously, but it couldn't have a ballistic entry where essentially you're coming in like a rock. It actually had to fly itself down to the surface to make its footprint on the surface of the planet small enough so it could fit in the landing location that the scientists wanted to go to. And that landing location 
was and is Gale Crater. And what Gale Crater is, is a region where we believe water once flowed on the surface of Mars. And water actually sort of stagnated on the surface of Mars and created sedimentary rock layers. Because where better to look at the evidence of past life than an ancient water body? And so the scientists, by collecting many images of the surface of the planet, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, were able to pinpoint several spots they'd like to go to. And this is the one that they finally selected. And we designed the landing system to make sure that they got there, and Curiosity got there, safely, and landed in an ellipse so that it didn't snap into the size of the impact crater wall, and didn't snap into a mountain called Mount Sharp, which is six kilometers tall in the middle. So it's basically a game of having precision and the capability to land a massive object on the surface of the planet. Um, through a very thin atmosphere, but an atmosphere nonetheless. So just to give you an idea of the accuracy of our landing system, um, the little circle in the middle is Curiosity. So basically, we actually got it down all the way down to 12 um, miles by about 4 miles, which is roughly 20 kilometers by about 7 kilometers of landing lifts. But you can see here the Viking lander, this wow. massive landing lifts. This is from the 1970s. Pathfinder, really large landing lifts. So those landing systems could not have landed us in Gale Crater because we wouldn't have known whether we would stack into the size of the impact crater or stack into Mount Sharp. You have to have a landing position in order to get you to the location that you wanted to go. That's what drove us to our very sophisticated landing system. And so I'll just walk you through it one more time, um, just so I can talk to you from a technology perspective. If I can find my cursor. There we go. So when you start coming in around 13,000 miles an hour, you actually use aerodynamic drag in this blood body to get you from 13,000 down to 1,000 miles an hour. So the majority of the energy dissipation is actually not on the heat shield, um, which is a, a, an object which actually absorbs all of that um, high thermal energy. When you get to around 1,000 miles an hour, you deploy a very large supersonic parachute, which gets you from two times the speed of sound on Mars down to just below the speed of sound, roughly 250 miles an hour. At that point, you can't get any more drag of the parachute. You hit the velocity, you cut it away, and then you do the rest of the descent on retro rockets. And that slows you down from roughly 250 miles an hour down to around 20 miles an hour. And when you get around 60 feet above the surface, you start the sky crane maneuver, which is lowering the rover on 73 ropes. And there's several reasons why we selected this. One of the primary ones is actually to increase the distance above the ground with those engine booms on the surface. Those engine booms are basically powerful jets that you fire them into the sandbox and you create a massive dust cloud. So that's one of the primary reasons why we selected the sky crane maneuver. The secondary reason was so that we could land wheels down on the surface, eliminating the need for a landed platform. So that was the architecture that we used. Um, it had never been done before. And what's important to note is that this system, because of its complexity, because of its size, and because it flies on Mars, not Earth, you can never test this on Earth end to end at a time. The first time we ever test the entry system is on landing days. That's why it's so challenging. That's why we call it seven minutes of terror, because we've spent seven years of our lives developing this system, you know, engineering the hell out of these things, each individual aspect working on it to my particular system the parachute system. So that we understand each phase, but we only get to piece those phases together by using an end-to-end -end simulation. So that's why the scary part is that you only get to do it for real on landing day. And because of the mass limitations, you can't have any redundancy in the system. So you get one parachute, every engine has to operate with the spec, the heat shield has to operate with the spec, or you basically smash into the surface of the planet. So that's the engineering challenge associated with this. That being said, that also makes it a really fun project to work on, right? I mean, what, what else can make your day happier than being able to get to work every day? It's like, how the hell am I going to do this thing? This thing keeps blowing up on me. I need to fix this. So for us, it's challenging, but that's what we like to do. So, so for us, it, it, was, um, it, it was probably the, probably the highlight of my career, just because you don't get to do these things every year, and then they happen roughly once every decade or so. And so this is kind of 2D representation of that entry sequence. And there's it's basically a separate engineer responsible for each one of these phases who understood from a fundamental physics perspective what was going on with their system. And so just to give you a little brief overview of my role in the project, which was developing this parachute system, and this parachute is incredibly large because the atmosphere is really thin. The parachute is basically, um, size-wise, this is an international regulation soccer field, so basically you can fit roughly five of these parachutes inside of an international regulation soccer field. It's a really big parachute. And so, as you can imagine, it's really hard to test. Um, and so I have one fun video, because everyone always likes to see videos, and this isn't the one that blows up, this was a successful one. So we do these tests um, at around 3,000 feet altitude in the desert to make sure that they're structurally qualified for Mars. This was a successful test. We demonstrated the load that was required. 
But as people always ask, how do you know that that is going to be? I don't know. I guess that's not showing it for some reason. Um, the challenge, however, is that the environment on Mars is quite different than the environment on. I can't see it. It's like here we go. So this is actually what happens to a parachute that flies on Mars. It experiences something called a supersonic aerodynamic instability, which causes it to collapse and reinflate. So the challenge was us to understand from a fundamental physics perspective what it was going to see on Mars and come up with a test program which would replicate that at Earth, which happens to be challenging, but we were able to do it. And we did it with a combination of computer simulations. And so I'll show you one computer simulation here. This is actually what's going on from an aerodynamics perspective um, to the parachute, which is causing it to collapse and reinflate. And we also built little subscale test parachutes that we tested in supersonic wind tunnels, which were able to simulate the conditions on Mars. And then similarly, we have to develop the sky crane system. This is what scared me most of the mission. People always ask me what scared you most. The part I work on is the part somebody else was working on. Because I knew what I was doing. But, um, <laughs> but this is the scary part, because the sky crane was never tested. You get to test each one of those engines in a vacuum chamber attached to an engine block, um, but you never got to fly that thing down to the surface of the planet. So that's really scary. It's a tremendous, um, basically, guidance, navigation, and control problem challenge. So my approach with the mission actually was assessing how much um, ground erosion we were going to see because of those engine plumes exhausting on the surface of the planet. And if I can get this movie to work, I'll show you this is what happens. So when this engine is fired into the, um, basically a immersion sandbox here, and it creates this massive explosion on the surface of the planet. Um, and I'll show you another video in a little bit, which explains why this is problematic. But the rover itself, its primary goal is to explore um, the region of which it landed and looking for evidence of past habitability. And to give you the scale of the rover, there's me, I'm pretty small, but nevertheless, you can see how big that rover is. Six massive wheels, a tremendous um, mobility system which allows it to go over rocks, which are around one meter in size, and that enables it to travel on a ground slope up to 30 degrees, which means it can go to really interesting locations and find fascinating scientific information. I have tons of cameras. Obviously, a lot of the information we collect is with images, in addition to some sophisticated instruments that I'll tell you later. But everybody also wants to know what's the power system for this. This one did not operate off of solar arrays. It operates off of a RTG, which is a nuclear power source. It's basically a radioactive decay of plutonium, which generates heat, you convert it to electricity, and you get a couple hundred watts of power. And that makes it less sensitive to the solar radiation environment, allows it to operate for a longer time during the day and over a longer period of the year because you're less sensitive to the sun angle. Some of the pretty sophisticated instruments that we had on board um, was a mass spectrometer, which allows you to determine both elemental composition as well as mineralogical composition, which is key to understanding the presence of organics on the surface of the planet. So we are currently looking for organics, which are building blocks of life. And then we had other um, instruments like Kemen and LIBS to determine the chemical composition of the Martian soil and rocks. And I always like to show this picture because everyone's like, you've got a laser on board, so you're blowing things up on Mars. It doesn't quite look but it's funny. <laughs> and, um, and then this is the other one. This is a really funny one. <laughs> that went around the web for a long time. I'm not going to address the other question when somebody asked me for the other one. But, um, but that laser, what it actually does is it doesn't kill Martian cats, but we fire it at rocks, and then it actually explodes those rocks. They form a gas, and we look at the spectric stuff and signature of those rocks from a distance away to determine what the composition is. So really sophisticated um, instruments to understand the chemical and the mineralogical composition of the planet. And we also have a weather station there and a um, radiation measuring station as well. So we have a robotic arm, which is what allows us to take those wonderful panoramic shots of itself. So there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, what is it called? When people, uh, like the Capricorn one, it's like you didn't actually land there. It's how you're able to take a picture of yourself we piece together the images that it takes off with of a robotic arm. Um, but I worked in the mission for around seven years, and then we had a delay of two years in launch because you only get to go to Mars every 24 months to go on the minimum energy uh, trajectory. So we actually had to delay from 2009 to 2011. Uh, we installed it on the launch vehicle. We launched it in November of 2011. It was a successful launch, uh, which is obviously very successful with our global launch pad. Uh, so eight and a half months of travel, cruise to the destination of Mars, and then finally on August 5th is landing night. And we had this unique opportunity on this mission where we had a camera on the underside of the rover looking down at the surface of the planet. So the video I'm going to show you is of the actual landing 
um, sequence on Mars, and it starts with the heat shield falling away. So this is the rover looking down towards the surface of the planet. And what you see is the rover basically on the parachute, so it's swinging back and forth a little bit, that's what parachutes tend to do to you, and you're seeing what the rover is seeing. This is the bird's eye view. And so we're continuing our descent at this point. We're probably around 200 miles an hour at this point. What we can see is the region that we're planning on landing in. And the darkened region here we believe to be a volcanic region as opposed to that which surrounds it has more dust and soil on the surface. And you can also see a whole variety of impact craters on the surface of the planet. So because the Martian atmosphere is quite thin, you get a lot of impacts that don't get burnt up in the atmosphere as you would know in a planet, a bigger atmosphere like Earth. And so what's going to happen next is we're going to come off the parachute because it gets cut away, and then we're going to start our retropulsive descent towards the surface. And at that point, you're going to see the divert maneuver where we go off around 500 meters to the side, and then we're descending retropulsively towards the surface of the planet. So at this point, I think we're on the retro rockets because you can see that we're no longer swinging back and forth between the parachutes. These images are actually of relevance to a future technology called terrain relative navigation. We actually take the images to process what our altitude is and how to avoid hazards. Uh, now what you're going to see is the start of the strike crane maneuver. The rover's wheel is going to fall into view. It releases the mobility system. Now you're starting to see the interaction of the gas plumes with the surface of the planet. All that gas is being kicked up. This happened around 60 feet above the surface. At this point, the rover is now being lowered on the tether, and you really can't see anymore because so much sand and dust is being generated. And it's essentially landed at this point. And the first image that came up after landing was this. The rover was demanded to take a picture of itself. And of course, when we saw this, we were ecstatic, you know, jumping and screaming in the room because this means it worked. Our great fear was that the tether would get caught the rover be dragged across the surface of the planet. That didn't happen, thank goodness. But so it was successful. And so this was um, us in the control room at the end of landing. So you could imagine we were quite happy in our best by Elvis, I don't like to say. But um, <laughs> this was my very favorite picture of labor, having a wonderful party um, afterwards. And then this image finally came in, it demanded the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to put itself in position to take a picture of the rover under the parachute on its ascent. And so this obviously means everything was successful. The parachute looks fully formed. It doesn't have any holes in it beyond the one that it's supposed to have in it. And so this to me was, you know, icing on the cake for an evening that went relatively perfectly. These are some images of the surface of the planet to show you all the different pieces of the entry system as they came off. Curiosity is in the middle. That's where the sky crane crashed off the side and hit its job. The heat shield made its way over there. The back shell of the parachute over there. And uh, this will give you an idea of how good our engineering predictions were. This was our landing lift, so 20 kilometers by 7 kilometers. We landed almost spot in the middle, which means that it was a nominal day on Mars, and all of our engineering parameters that we had generated ahead of time were relatively accurate. This is also another fun picture that's taken. So the parachute now lives on the surface of the planet for all time. We actually constantly take images of it. You can see it flopping around in the breeze. And so that's it there, having done its thing. And then these are some images of the burn marks that were made on the surface because of those engines as they cooled into the ground. So I wanted to wrap up the talk with giving you some of the science results that we collected today. I will caveat that by saying I am not a Mars planetary scientist. I'm an engineer, so I can't tell you all the details of what this means. But with the uh, RAD um, and REDS tool, we've been able to make radiation measurements on the surface of Mars, which suggests that the radiation environment is actually more benign than we thought it was, which is good for future potential human colonization. We're making temperature, wind, and pressure measurements on the surface. So you see those cycles there it's because of the diurnal variation when the sun comes up and the sun goes down, the temperature and the pressure varies. Um, so it gets pretty warm, so it can actually get up to around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but those would have been centigrade, those temperatures. But, but it can get around 40 degrees where we particularly landed. Now this is the PEMCAM, which is the LIBS laser instru instrument, the laser-induced breakdown, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, where we fire that laser into a rock, which allows us to determine what the chemical composition of the rock is. Um, and a really important finding that we have is that we have confirmed that the location where we landed, water did once flow there. And this is a nice picture which shows you what the base of an ancient riverbed on Earth looks like and the base of what an ancient riverbed on Mars looks like. And you see the way the rocks are formed and the way that their rocks are rounded because of the flow of the water. And so that's important because we did land where the scientists wanted to go, which is the ancient water body. And this is another example of some of the surface material that we looked at where we landed, where we're actually having indication of sediment transport, so the formation of sedimentary rocks in what was an ancient water body. And the most important finding, and I would say the most recent finding, is that we confirmed that the soil that we landed in is actually pH neutral. And so this is important because all the other places that we landed on before, we found soil that has been acidic. And all the life can 
grow in acidic soil here on Earth. It's very difficult. It's more toxic. You have more limitations of life that can exist there. In the landing site where we landed in Gale Crater, we see a pH neutral environment, which means that it's far more habitable for life as we know it, and, and in the range of life forms that could be supported in that environment. So it's been very successful so far, and I'm probably not going to go through any more of the science results other than to say that the scientists love to make measurements all the time, and so we actually haven't been able to go very far yet. So we landed at the landing site in green, or at one L now, and we still have a long way to drive. And so we have gotten to the point where um, we want to stop making all the interim science measurements and just start the drive to get over to the uh, lower reaches of Mount Sharp. Um, but it has been a tremendous journey, I would say, for probably the roughly thousand people or so that worked on this mission, it was certainly a tremendous journey for me. And now I have moved on to another project, but this is something which is going to stay with me for the rest of my life, for the rest of my career. And the information that we collect as part of this mission really does tell us more about ourselves in the solar system and the universe. So I hope that it inspires you as well. Thank you. So the Spirit and Opportunity rovers had a design life of 90 days. And so just to give you an idea of how well we design these systems, um, Opportunity is still going for 10 years. <laughs> so this particular rover is going to last a very long time, most likely. Um, so it has uh, the power supply, for example, the, the decay rate of the half-life of plutonium is, it takes a really, really long time. So that going to last for a decade. That thing's not going to run out. You have redundant avionics on board, so if one computer breaks, we have another computer to go to. Because we're not using solar panels, we don't have to worry about dust deposition, decaying the amount of power that we have. So it will probably last for many years, but the nominal design life is two years for this mission. But the RTG, the nuclear power source, does facilitate a longer design life and a more capable science mission. I know you're an engineer, awesome. But I have, a, I have one question uh, scientifically. If the soil uh, pH is uh, neutral, or as you say, um, is it possible that, have, have you guys thought of actually trying to plant or bring that soil back to try and plant to see if something would grow? Well, we all, so the, the next mission type that's always on the horizon, unfortunately, because of a bunch of budget constraints never seems to happen, is a Mars sample return mission, where we would take a sample of the soil, put it um, inside of a box, put it inside of a launch vehicle, which is sitting on the surface of Mars, launch that launch vehicle up into orbit around Mars, it reconnects with the spacecraft, makes its way back to Earth, and then lands on Earth. The Mars sample return mission architecture is something we've developed. There's some technologies that are missing to facilitate that mission, but not that many. It's only really just a couple of years away. And so we would love to do that, but it takes time and it takes money. And because of all of the budget constraints that we have, that mission called Mars sample return keeps on getting pushed out a few years into the future. Um, in terms of whether or not you can plant things in there now, we have very strict uh, guidelines with regards to planetary protection. And they're actually uh, um, all of the different space agencies participate, not just the United States, where we do everything we can to make sure that we don't contaminate the planet with our own life forms. So for example, we clean the thing really well, we bake it out to around 125 degrees C, kill off any microbes, and kill off any spores, and then of course in the vacuum environment of space, most of the uh, microbial material will die off, but the spores only die off when you actually cook them. So we have a goal to not contaminate plants, which we think would conceivably support life or may have life on it. So. That being said, if we were ever to send people there in the future, then that blows that to the wind, right? And, yeah. then, and then we'd have to change that architecture. But right now, we've made an agreement to not do any kind of contamination on Mars, on Europa, um, on anything where we think there might be life forms. But I think back in the 1970s, during the Viking Lander mission, they did have something called a life detection instrument. It's very difficult to detect life. And so you just kind of set yourselves up for failure if you put an instrument on there, which may or may not work, because then the public thinks, oh, well, you didn't find anything. So, OK, that's a dead planet. So we, we want to um, sort of take baby steps towards understanding first that there was water, next that it was habitable, making a determination if we can find organics. And then maybe the next step would be a life detection. But that's not this mission. That's a future mission. Okay. So first, thanks. We've had a lot of cool things at Russ Campus, but this is by far the coolest. So we've got a lot of people, we've got a lot of people here on a daily basis who are trying to create innovations. Tell me about that meeting where the lunatic says, hey, I got an idea. How about a sky cream? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I mean, the Skycrane maneuver is actually something which is used in Earth-based systems by helicopter pilots. So the idea of, of bringing some, a payload down on the end of a dangling rope is done for sort of Earth-based applications, so it's not brand new in that sense. It looks crazy, and um, it's very difficult to do, and there's certainly a risk associated with it, but the requirements of the mission, which are driven by science, uh, dictated it, right? So if we weren't going to do something as ambitious scientifically, then we wouldn't necessarily have had to have done that. There are other approaches, for example, you can go retropropulsive all the way to the ground, but when you do that, remember I showed you that massive dust cloud? That was from 60 feet above the surface. If you put those engines all the way to the surface of the ground, you end up putting yourself potentially into a crater, because we had no idea if where we were landing was essentially an infinite sand bed, or if it was bedrock. Viking landed in bedrock, Phoenix landed in bedrock. We didn't know where we were going to land. We thought it was actually going to be quite sandy. Um, so it kind of necessitated um, those design choices. And so it was up to us as the engineering team um, to prove to people that we could do this and we weren't making it up. And it was a lot of work. I mean, I don't deny it. I mean, I, my, my, my life was very difficult for many years and I was one of many people just in my little portion of the world. But, um, but you have to come up with sort of out of the box bizarre solutions to find um, solutions to difficult problems, whether it's for the space program or for, um, for any sector of the economy or anything that you're doing. So I think, I think what's different about the space program and people working in it is that we only deal with incredibly difficult problems, so that doesn't really phase us, because we know we have to do that anyway. And so, but I think there's there's value in other people thinking that way, whether it's like the healthcare sector or the IT sector. Why not, right? I mean, you'll come up with something amazing as a result, hopefully. <laughs> So a lot of us do a lot of unit testing and integration testing in our current fields, and I'm very curious what you guys did. Unit testing, did you say? The unit testing and integration testing. So it's like when you've got a thing where you don't know, you're making all these guesses, I'm sure there's a lot of interesting stories there that can help <laughs> make our lives more interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, even from my own perspective on what I did, um, we had so many failures during the course of the development of the parachute. Actually, the very second test, that we, no, the very first test that we did, the parachute blew up. <laughs> so if that gives you any idea of how stressful things can be. And the thing is, you learn from your mistakes, and you test, test, test until you get it right, right? until you actually have confidence. Because we're, we're dealing with like single quantities, we can't do any sort of statistical-based testing, so we can't do any lock testing, with the exception of pyrotechnics. Um, so we have to do testing where we physically understand what is going on from a fundamental physics perspective so that we don't have to just have you know um, curve fits where we actually have an empirical more than an empirical understanding of what's going on but so for example the heat shield material they had a test program for about three years of looking at a whole variety of conditions to make sure that thermal protection system materials survive we had a test program for the parachute which looked at full scale qualification as well as subscale aerodynamic understanding what the drag performance was going to be so every single aspect of this mission involves a relatively massive test program which is up also coupled to a typically computational fluid dynamics program as well. We validate the computational fluid dynamics simulations, which is one of the things I showed you before. But yeah, certainly what I am is an experimentalist, so for me I love doing the test programs, but um, that's an integral part of what we do. The challenge is in piecing together all that information to make sure that the system end-to-end -end works. Hi. Um, I seem to remember the previous Mars lander um, uh, uh, had a an unsuccessful uh, conclusion because someone made it, uh, forgot to make a conversion between like, metric and inches or something like that. Um, am I right about that or am I thinking about something? Completely so there was an orbiting spacecraft um, which there was a unit conversion error, and so because of that, the trajectory sent it into the planet when it was actually supposed to be orbiting the planet. But there was a separate failure, which was the Mars 98 lander, where um, the thing crashed into the surface of the planet. We don't really definitively know what happened. One of the theories is that the landing leg coming down triggered the engines to cut off, and they cut off too high. So there has been one failure of a landed mission, which was the, the Mars 98 lander. Ironically, the Phoenix lander, which I think was in 2005, was the sister spacecraft that was sitting in storage for that, so we had to redesign some aspects of it. So that system ended up actually landing on the surface of Mars and working successfully, and, and so they, they, they mitigated the concern about that landing leg potentially triggering the engine to shut off. But that was because during that day, it was a better, faster, cheaper error. We actually had to cut back significantly on the amount of testing that was done. And so if we had done a good end-to-end -end test program there, hopefully we would have found that failure. And there was another example of that on the Genesis probe. Um, Genesis probe, which fortunately we've been able to collect the science data, but the parachute never deployed because somebody had installed the G-Center switch backwards, and so the switch never activated. Now, if they had done the test program, which we would, have, would do now, they would have seen that they installed it backwards, um, and then the parachute would deployed, and that wouldn't have happened. So it's really important, as the gentleman in the back was saying, to have a very 
end-to-end -end test programs that you verify all the different phases of your mission. But we do have failures, and you have to learn from your mistakes, right? So uh, we can never expect to be 100% successful all the time. And the robotic space program allows us to have failures because we're not hurting anybody in the process. It's much more difficult for human space flight because you don't want to you know, kill people. <laughs> Since it's your wheelhouse, I'm curious about some of the parameters of the parachute. Um, <laughs> in particular, um, for instance, if the payload got much bigger, such that the weight of the parachute was proportional, was, was less proportionally, could you just use a parachute to land it? Um, no. Uh, so the size parachute that you need to land, even a smaller rover like the size of MER, is uh, far too big. What about the big rover? Like what about, well even so Sojourner was a baby rover in comparison, Sojourner was only about that big and we still have to have a 12 meter parachute and retro rockets for that just because the atmosphere is so thin. But the size of parachutes, you need to have a cluster, so you need to have roughly three parachutes and those parachutes, I don't know, I actually did the calculation, need to be like 100 feet in diameter. And um, the problem with deploying parachutes uh, supersonically is that they're really chaotic. So if you had a supersonic cluster, they would probably tangle between each other and get destroyed. So unfortunately, the atmosphere is just too thin. There's something else that you can do, which is deploy your decelerator higher up in the atmosphere at an even higher Mach number to have your deceleration go early on. That, develop, that requires the generation of new aerodynamic accelerator technology, which we're actually developing now. But at the end of the day, you'll always have to have some kind of load attenuation for Mars landing, whether it's an airbag, a crushable, or retro rockets for the terminal descent phase. For a relatively, for a payload that we would want to use. Uh, so, are there any possibilities that this thing land on rock? So, will it tip over and uh, how are you going to deal with that problem? And uh, there is, I have a second question. So, uh, I know it's probably not that practical, but uh, how can I make one like this? How what? How can I make one like this? How can you make one like this? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, the first question is so, we designed it to land. Um, where one of its wheels would actually land on a rock, which was one meter in diameter, um, and on up to a 30 degree ground slope. We selected um, those conditions based off the surveys that we did of the potential landing site. So we know with, I think with 95% confidence, that we wouldn't see rocks um, greater than one meter, and that we wouldn't see ground slopes greater than 30 degrees. So the system was designed and tested to land on the environment that we expect ourselves to be in with 95% confidence, not 100% confidence. So, so we did take that into account. We also do a whole bunch of um, multi-body dynamic simulations to look at what that event looks like as well. Um, so that's, we, we mitigate that with tests and by design. How you can work on it? Come work for JPL. <laughs> but the thing is, when you come up with one of these systems, obviously it costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of resources, a lot of infrastructure, and so because we've been doing these missions for you know, the past several decades, we have unique capability you know, at NASA in the United States that other people don't have just because they haven't done it before. It's not something you can just like, oh, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. It requires a lot of expertise, a lot of experience, a lot of computational abilities, a lot of test facilities, a lot of manufacturing capabilities that require actually many, many decades to, to get to from starting from scratch to where we are today. So, but that doesn't mean you can't work on it because you can come and work for, you can come up with your own private company that develops some technology for, for rovers that they might use in the future. So there's many people who are involved in the space program and I'm pulling off these missions from undergraduate students to high school students to you know people who work at all the different NASA centers. So it, it, it's very much a collective effort, so. Um, where do you think we'll be in 10 years in terms of the science? And then we'll compare that to if there was no budget. Where do you think we'd be in 10 years in terms of the science? So I think the right, the best way to get more sophisticated science information on Mars is to bring a sample back to Earth. Because the capabilities of Earth-based laboratories are essentially infinite compared to what you could bring um, to you to Mars. So if we could do that kind of mission, we would advance our knowledge of Mars, you know, like a by a quantum leap. But that requires money and resources and the political will to make that happen. Um, so uh, we can land, so for example, the next mission that we're planning is to go and, and look at more interesting sites to do more science, but it's to cache a sample, so a sample that we can one day bring back to Earth. Um, so I think that's the problem is that it, 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 uh, eventually, now the other, the other side of the coin is that we could 
work on miniaturizing the instrumentation technologies, right? We can come up with more miniature versions of like mass spectrometers. But I think if you want to look at really long hydrocarbon chains for the purpose of organic determination, there's only so heavy a mass spectrometer you can bring. You really want to bring that back to Earth and use technologies besides mass spectrometers. So that's why Mars sample return is really the best way to improve our understanding. Now, the other thing which people always talk about is visit more sites on Mars, right? Because if you only go to one place, like you ended up landing in the middle of the Nevada desert, that's not going to give you any indication of what planet Earth is right, like, right? So if we had more missions, we could land in a more diverse set of spaces and get a lot more information um, and a lot more data points to look at trends. So that's another way of approaching the problem. But, uh, but more missions and more sample return, I think, is the right way to move uh, our understanding up. But that requires money. <laughs> more questions, Ron? Uh, I wonder, uh, have you heard about Project One, which is the one-way uh, mission to Mars with two humans? And what do you think about that? Well, I, I heard of, I have heard of that a little bit. I've also heard the architecture that the first people that we send there should be retirees because they're going to die anyway, so just send them there. And then never get the one way journey. So that's also project one for retirement purposes. Um, but I think that's an interesting architecture. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think the first explorers, you know, it, for, uh, for human beings, it was the same thing, right? It was a one way journey for them. So I, I think that that's an appropriate way of looking at things. I think if adults make the conscious decision that, that they want to do this and they're okay with the one-way journey, that's one thing. That would probably have to be a private venture because there's no way a government would sign up to that, right, just because of the way it looks. Um, but I, don't, I, I personally don't have a problem with that. Um, I think we are, from a technology perspective, just because I know because I'm working on it, we do have to develop several more technologies to be able to land human-sized payloads on the surface of the planet. And that's still about 10 to 15 years away just to develop those technologies. Um, but it is feasible, it is doable, it's just about, once again, time and resources. Um, and, and, and it's not, it can't just be a NASA thing, it has to be a global um, initiative. It cannot be a one country initiative. So I think that's part of the problem is that if we could learn to work together and, and tackle these problems collectively, we could pull these things off in, you know, probably at least a factor of two reduction in time and probably a factor of ten reduction in cost, which would change everything. But that's politics. <laughs> Last question is for Frank. Yes, um, at the beginning of the video, I thought I saw that there were thousands of lines of code involved. I was just curious what kind of programming language was behind it and the test and simulation and case scenario if this fails, then this program kicks in. I would say I'm not a software person. It probably was in C or something like C, um, but we do tons and tons of end-to-end -to -end testing specifically focused on software. And so everything that we do, um, basically probably about three years into the mission until landing day is all software focused. And so all of our test beds are designed to go through the flight software, make sure that we don't find any problems. And we had a whole bunch of problems actually on our transit out to Mars, which were software related. But fortunately they were fixable because you can upload new commands and new sequences to solve that problem. But my background has never been in software development, so I'm probably like the worst person to answer software questions, but um, but there are many other people at JPL who probably can't answer software questions, and I am very hardware centric and hardware biased just because that's what I do. But obviously, all the stuff is software driven. That whole system sequence you saw there was autonomous; it was all entirely driven by software in terms of pulling it off. So it was critical to the success of the mission. But we did test the hell out of that software. So.